Good morning once again. Happy day to all of you. <clears throat> and this morning, on scriptural authority. In the first four lessons, we have talked about the necessity for authority. What is authority? Authority is the one who has the, the right to command. He not only has the right to command, but what? Expects obedience from his command. That's authority. And so we also learn about the necessity, the need to have authority. If there is no authority, everything will be chaos. There will be anarchy in religion. And so we know that the one who has the authority is Jesus Christ, given to him by God the Father. And his authority is not only in heaven, but on, it includes the earth. And so whatever Jesus says, we studied in the previous lessons, that those things that Jesus commanded us came from the Father. And finally, we learn that in religion there is authority. And the authority is the New Testament or the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. John 12, 48 finally settles the problem of what is our supreme authority. And it says, Jesus said, He that rejected me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. In other words, all of us will be judged by just one book and the same book which is the New Testament. So that you will not be judged by what your religion teaches. You will not be judged by what your denomination teaches. You will be judged and all of us will be judged by what Jesus had said. And don't forget that one of our aim in studying scriptural authority is to find out the reason why are there many churches today all claiming to be the church of Jesus Christ teaching different conflicting doctrine why many churches when in fact we have only one Bible the same Bible. What's the reason? One reason, as uh, we have studied yesterday, is because all religions have their own doctrines that are not found in the Bible. They teach doctrines which Jesus did not teach. They teach doctrines contrary to what Jesus teaches. And that brings us to our <coughs> lesson this morning. To know how the Bible teaches. And by the way, the Bible was not written in a language that we cannot understand. In fact, the Bible can be understood even by someone who has not gone to school. That is how simple the Word of God is. Why did God make it so simple? Because God wants 
or to be saved. God wants everyone to understand His will because He wants all to be saved. But the problem is, not all wants to be saved. You see? And so, when we come to study how the Bible teaches, we are going to learn principles in communication. Principles that we use every day. We use it in our home, when we talk to our children, we hear people talking to each other. They use the same principles. You go to school, the professors, the teachers, use the same principles. You listen to court hearings, the same principles are being used by the lawyers. <coughs> so this is not something new. This is not something uh, different. We have been using these principles all the days of our life. And that is how God communicates to us. God talked to us in human language. And so there is no reason that we cannot understand. In fact, Jesus said, those who wanted to know the will of the Father, they can know the will. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, don't be foolish not to understand the word, the word of God because the Bible can be understood. So we will just uh, try to remind ourselves of the same principles that we are using every day. And the same principles you find when we study the Word of God. And that is how God speaks to us. Now, our lesson for this morning is how to establish scriptural authority. In other words, how to know that such teaching is authorized by God and how to identify and how to know that such teaching is not found in the Bible. So if it is not found in the Bible, where did that come from? That teaching came from men. It was men who made that doctrine. Now let's start. We want to develop a clear understanding as to how God may command or forbid us to do certain things. So as we study scriptural authority, we will learn that there are things which God commanded. There are things which God did not command. And why are we doing it? So. Scriptural authority will also explain why we practice what we are doing now. Why is it that this religion practices this kind of teaching, this other religion does not practice it, and both claim that they teach what the Bible teaches? Then we will be able to find out. Who is teaching the truth? Or maybe both are not teaching the truth as far as the Bible or the authority of God is concerned. And so we need to understand that the Bible is a communication from God to man by the use of human language. God did not use unknown tongue or tongue or language that cannot be understood. He used plain simple language. As I said earlier, the purpose is so that many can understand God's will and many will go to heaven. Did I say it said again? Many understood what the Bible teaches. This is the truth. They actually understood what the Bible teaches, but they refused to accept what the Bible teaches. Now, therefore, as we read the Bible, 
we must use the human mind to understand what God is saying to us. See, the human mind is influenced by so many different things that we need some basic guidelines that are proper and useful to help us understand the Bible. Thus, our objective is to try to determine what basic guidelines are proper and useful to assist us in properly understanding what God want, uh, wants us to do or not to do. Okay. In Revelation 11.1, 1, John was commanded to measure the temple. What do you need in measuring the temple? What does John need? Of course, he needs a measuring stick. That's the authority. So, how do you determine a doctrine that came from God? How do you know if that doctrine is being taught by God? You go to the measuring run. You go to the authority as far as religion is concerned. And that is the Bible or the Word of God. So you will find out that every religion that is made by men, they have another authority which is not found in the Bible. And we call that their statement of faith and practices. They have, every religion has different authority. These are doctrines that are made by men. Now, how do we establish authority? How do we know that such a doctrine is taught by God? As we study the Bible, how do we know that this is the one taught by God? Or it is not taught by God? How do we know? We will be using three principles. Direct statement, statement of facts, you read in the Bible that there are statements of facts, there are direct statements, there are commands. Another way how the Bible teaches us is because there might be no, no direct statement or commands, but there we see approved examples. We see in the Bible that the early Christians that the apostles were doing it. So, that is another way how we determine that this is taught by God and it is not taught by God because we see that there are examples. And the third method of how we do we learn if a doctrine is taught by God or not, when we read the Bible, there are statements There may be no command. There may be no appropriate examples. But we can see by necessary inference. So when it is implied by God, man infers. In other words, it is unavoidable conclusion. A conclusion that you cannot escape. Others call it common sense. So, the Bible also teaches by necessary influence. We are going to these different principles of learning as we go along. Okay. There are only three ways possible for us to teach anything on any subject. And as we have already discussed earlier, the three ways are ways that we always use in our human language. Now, it is humanly impossible to communicate a law or a command by the use of human language without using one or all of these principles. So you will observe that in our everyday communication, we either 
communicate through direct statement or statement of facts or commands. We also communicate by example and we also communicate by inference. So, let us discuss this one by one. We need to be consciously aware of these principles so that we can seek to apply them consistently to the Bible. So, in this way, it will help us understand the Bible correctly. We will not be confused, but we will understand the Bible correctly on the subject that seems to be controversial. So you will encounter that there are those who took a topic as controversial. So when it is controversial, then we apply the three principles of learning. Is there a command, a statement of fact, or direct statement? Is there an example, or can it be implied? or infer. So, what are the three ways? The first one is a direct statement. There are four ways of asserting a direct statement. We will learn about that. The second way is by example, meaning we see an example in the Bible that it was being done. The third is by necessary inference. Okay. In a direct statement, you will notice when you study the Bible, there are commands in the Bible. So, a command may be positive or negative. For example, of a positive command, it says, do this. Acts 11, 23 to 26, Jesus said, do this. That's a command. So therefore, we have to do it. You do not have to quarrel over it. Say, do this. That's a positive command. Another positive command is, in Acts 2, 38, Peter said, repent, you repent, you be baptized. That's a command. So repentance is a command. It's not an option. You repent, you be baptized for the remission of sin. So in Acts 2, 38, we read in the Bible that it is a command. Repentance is a command. Baptism is a command. So in other words, why is it that we have to do this? Repentance. Well, because God commanded it. Why is it that we have to baptize people? Yeah, because God commanded it. Baptism is a command. Now, in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, collection is also a command. As I had given orders, Paul said, as I had given orders to the churches in Galatia, it's a command. Even so do ye. You do it likewise. So, giving collection is a command. Ephesians 5, 19, we read, singing is a command. Sing. First Corinthians eleven twenty four, we can read that the Lord's Supper is a command. Do this. Okay, so that is how the Bible teaches by positive command. Now the Bible teaches also by negative commands. Negative command example: Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Do not do it. That's, that's a command stated in a negative way. For example, 
In Hebrews 10.25, do not forsake the assembly. Do not be absent. That's a command, but stated in the in a negative way. Forsake na, do not be absent. No corrupt speech. A Christian is commanded that when he talks, there should be no corrupt speech that will come out of his mouth, like cursing, cursing. It's a command not to do those things. No immorality in Ephesians 5, 3 to 5. That's a command. That a Christian is commanded not to commit immorality, not to commit fornication, not to have another woman or another man in your life. That's a command to Christians. How is it commanded? In a negative way. Then, in Matthew 23, 8 to 10, Jesus said, There is no religious title. Do not use religious titles. What is an example of religious title? Jesus said, Call no man your father, because your father is in heaven. So when you call a human being father, that is forbidden. The word pastor. Pastor is not a title. We do not see the word pastor as a title. Pastor is a form of word. But why is it that people use it as a title? Jesus said, do not use title. Others use title. Others use elders as a title. That's not a title. Others use bishop as a title. You cannot read those titles in the Bible. So, you will begin to understand. You see? Why are they calling themselves pastors when that is prohibited? Another dangerous thing. There are people who call themselves clergy and call themselves reverend. Imagine. They call themselves reverend. There's only one reverend, and that is God. It is God who is the only reverend on, on earth. So, others are even proud. They did not know that that word reverend belongs to God. It does not belong to any human being. You see? Okay, so that is a command. No human titles. Again, the Bible teaches by a declarative statement. It is declared. For example, in Ephesians 1, for Ephesians 4, 4, the Bible teaches there is only one body. So do not teach that there are two bodies, that there are three bodies, because there is a statement of fact that the Bible teaches, God teaches there is only one body. It's not a command, positive, neither negative, but the Bible teaches by a declarative statement. It is declared there is only one body. Another, in Mark 16, 16, this is not a command, but a declarative statement. What was declared? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Is that a command? No, it's not a command. But it's a declarative statement that says, when a person believes and is baptized, that person is saved. You see, is that difficult to understand? It's very simple. God talked to us in human language. So, in other words, when is a person saved according to the declared statement of the Bible? A person is saved after he is baptized. Now, before a person is baptized, he must what? He must believe. You see the order in a statement. That is the way how to know that this doctrine is commanded by God or taught by God 
and you will be able to identify that such a doctrine is made by men. God did not teach it. Okay. The Bible teaches by interrogative statement. Interrogative means in the form of a question. So, let's look at the example. In 1 Corinthians 16, we see, we read, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? So, God wants us to learn, and he said it in the form of a question. Did you not know that you are the temple of God? So what does it mean? It means that we are the temple of God. You see? Second Peter 3, 11 to 12. What manner of persons ought you to be? So Peter is saying, as Christian, what kind of persons do you ought to be? So in other words, I should be this kind of a person as a Christian. That is what it teaches. But we were taught in the form of a question. Now, the Bible, and there are many examples of this in the Bible. I'm just showing some examples. Okay. The Bible teaches also by beseeching statement. Beseeching meaning if God is pleading or the apostles when they wrote, they were pleading. For example, it say in 1 Corinthians 1.10, this is talking about division. So, Paul, when he wrote, he said, I beseech you, meaning I plead with you not to create division. So what, what does it say? What does it mean? It means that division is abhorred by God. It means division is a sin. There been so many divisions of claiming to be Christ. You see, what do we read in 1 Corinthians 1.10? One would say, I am of Paul. Oh, you call him a polite Christian. I am of Cephas. What do you call him? Cephas Christian. I am of Christ. What do you call him? Christian. And then, Paul asks, Is Christ divided? What's the answer? No. So in other words, division is abhorred by God. God doesn't like division. How do we know that? By these verses that we read. Okay, another example. In John 14, 15. What did, John, what did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, see, Jesus was pleading. If you love me, what are we going to do? Keep my commandments. Now, you go the opposite way. Those who keep the commandments of Jesus Christ, what? These are the people who love him. You see? Another. Those who do not love Jesus, they do not keep his commandments. In other words, they do not observe, they do not follow, they do not obey what Jesus commands. So, what do you call these people? They don't love Jesus Christ. You see the danger? And you, do you see the beauty of following the commands of Jesus Christ? It shows that you love me. But when I disobey the commands of Jesus Christ, in truth and in fact, I do not love him. Oh, why are there so many religions? They claim to love Jesus Christ, and yet they do not keep his commandments. They teach other doctrines contrary. 
contrary to what Jesus teaches. Now, moving further. The second principle of how the Bible teaches is by approved apostolic example. We see the apostles doing it. We see the early Christians doing it. And so it becomes an example. Now, there may, there may be some examples in the Bible that are not approved. Meaning, we do not follow those examples. And one reason is because they are cultural or customary examples. Now, to give you one, you read in the Bible, greet everyone with a holy kiss. If you read it literally, it is correct. That is what they do. Holy kiss. They kiss each other. Why? Well, there's nothing wrong to them kissing each other because that is their culture. Did you notice? The Arabs, the Jews, when they greet each other, what do they do? We call beso beso. <laughs> what do they do? They kiss each other. That's how they greet. But in our culture, in the Western culture, how do we greet each other? We shake hands. That is how we kiss. We sh that is how we greet one another. So there are examples in the Bible because that is their culture. We do not follow it. But it, instead of kissing, we shake hands. That's how we greet. We follow our own culture. Okay. Bible teaching requires that we use examples or part of the pattern of the New Testament. So, Paul said, what you see in me, do. Okay, what you see, what you see in me. Paul was telling the early Christian. In other words, you follow and observe what Paul is doing. What he does, you also do. That's an example. Now, these are the verses we can read in the Bible. The scriptures plainly commands us to follow examples. Therefore, if commands are binding, then examples must be binding. So we learn two principles teaching or learning, direct statement and apostolic example. Let's go to application. Application of these examples. The first is in Acts 14, 23. Now, God commanded that in every local church there should be elders. So that is how the Bible teaches. That in the church that Jesus built, every local church should have elders. So that's the example that we can see. So today, in the local church of the Lord's church, in local churches, there should be elders. Why? Because we see examples in the Bible that the early churches, the local congregations, have elders. Now, another thing. What do you notice of elders? It's plural. You do not. What is plural? Plural means two or more. So you do not have one elder. There must be at least two or more. Elders are 
plural. How do we learn it? By the examples we read in the Bible. And by the way, elders are synonymous to pastors. Pastors, elders, they are the one and the same person. A pastor is an elder, an elder is a pastor. So you do not say there is one pastor, there are two or three elders. No, they are the same. In the Bible, the pastor is the elder, the elder is the pastor. Are you beginning to see things? Why there are many religions? Because they try to change what God had commanded. Now, a pastor is also called a presbyter. They are synonymous. A presbyter, elder, pastor, they are all the same. It reflects the work that they are doing. These are not titles. You also read in the Bible, bishop. Bishop, pastor, elders, presbyters, they are one and the same. There is no distinction. You know, what did man do? Oh, they make a distinction. The bishop is higher. Below him are the presbyters. Below them are the pastors. Below the pastors are the elders. There's no such thing in the Bible. Are you beginning to see how the Bible teaches? When men try to change the word of God, it's no longer the truth. And it cannot save. Now, another illustration. We read that the collection is done on the first day of the week. So, what day do we see in the Bible that collection is being made? What day? Every day? No. In the Bible, collection is done on the first day of the week. When you say first day, it is not seventh day. Seventh day is different from first day. First day is different from second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day. What is the first day? Sunday. What is the second day? Monday, second day of the week, third day, Tuesday, fourth day, Wednesday, fifth day, Thursday, sixth day, Friday, seventh day, Saturday. Of the seven, seven days, what days do we see an example of collecting? First day of the week. That's very plain. So, why do we collect Monday? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Why do we collect? You see, is the Bible difficult to understand? It's very easy to understand. What makes it difficult? These doctrines made by men are the ones that make that conflict with the Word of God. Because... The doctrines made by men is they can collect Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or every time they have a worship, every time they have a service, they make collection. Others would say, oh, our collection is Thursday. And those who try to follow the law of Moses, they say, our collection is seventh day. When the New Testament is very clear, by the examples that we read, collection is being done on the first day. Not every day. <laughs> Not every day. Okay. Another. What day do we see the apostles observing the Lord's Supper? In Acts 20 verse 7, the Lord's Supper is being observed when? The same as collection. First day of the week. You see? first day of the week. How do we know? By example. So, we do not have difficulty understanding which day. That is no problem. <coughs> okay. 
you have a problem understanding first thing, no problem. Now, the third principle of learning or teaching is that the Bible teaches by inference. It is inferred. God implied it. So when it is implied, we use our brains to analyze. In other words, you may not read an example or you may not read a direct statement, but it is inferred. So in other words, it is something that you don't literally read. You do not read it literally in the Bible, but it is implied. It is inferred. We will be going to examples. So, let's have an illustration on the proper use of necessary inference. Okay. I made a statement. I said, the figure is a square. One side is 12 inches. Those are the only two statements I said. The figure is a square. One side is 12 inches. No more than that. Now, what does it infer? Meaning, things which I did not say, but that is the unavoidable conclusion. It is still the truth, even though I did not say it. That is inference. Let's go to inference. Did I say that the perimeter is 48 inches? Did I say it? No, I did not say it. But is this statement correct? Yes. Why? Because it is inferred. Perimeter is the sum of the four sides. And we know that all the sides are equal because it is a square. One side is 12 inch inches, so therefore times 4, the perimeter is what? 48 inches. I did not say this is statement, but it is inferred. That is how inference works. And you will find several examples in the Bible things that are inferred. You know, some people try to debate, oh, I do not read in the Bible. The Bible did not say the Bible. You cannot read it in the Bible. They forgot. But the Bible teaches also by inference. Okay, another application of this is statement. Did I say that the area is 144 inches? I didn't. I did not say it. But is this statement correct? It is correct. How do we know it is correct? By, by inference. Area is what? Length times width. And because the length and the width are equal, so you multiply 12 times 12, that gives us an area of 144 inches. I did not say it, but it is inferred from the previous statement. Now, did I say that all the sides are also 12 inches? I did not say it. But it is inferred. Why? Because it is a square. So all the sides are equal. And one side is 12 inches. And because all the sides are equal, so therefore all the sides are also 12 inches. It is inferred. So you need several statements like this. You, you will be able to find out that there is no literal or word-for-word -word statement, but it is inferred. It is implied. We will be going to that later in the Bible as we apply these three principles. In the meantime, we will take a short break. Then, in a few moments, I will come back.
Thank you.